Hey good people, Sammy Ash here, the Executive Director of the Ash Academy, and your host of our Inspire, Uplift, Engage podcast. Just a couple of announcements before we get going. First, we have officially launched our Patreon. Perks include exclusive access to content, discounts on our events, and merch depending upon the tier. From friend of the foundation to friends like family, there's something for everyone in there to show your support and get a little something in exchange. Head on over to www.patreon.com slash the Ash Academy to start your membership today. And speaking of merch, just in time for the holidays, we are launching a little online shop of our very own soon. Please keep an eye out for more updates on our grand opening. Now, let's get started with the show. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Ash Academy's Inspire, Uplift, Engage podcast. I'm Sammy Ash, the Executive Director of the Ash Academy, and we're joined by friend of the foundation, Valerie Phoenix. Uh, she is an engineering manager and the founder slash CEO of Tech by Choice, a nonprofit helping underestimated adults enter, stay, and thrive in tech. And we have worked together on a project for their hackathon, so I'm super excited to have you back with us. You were at one of our first events this year before Outside was closed down, our Black Entrepreneur Expo and Mixer. So thank you so much for joining us. No, thank you. I'm excited to be here. And I had so much fun at your expo. I think that was the best way for me to start my year off with uh, community work because that was actually my first community event. Um, and it was actually one of the last ones. So I'm glad I <laughs> was able to go out with the bang until it's safe to go outside again. Awesome. Yeah, literally when I say it's our first event, that was like our first event that we had people at. So it's surprising like how well it did and nobody knew that it was our first event except for us. So <laughs> like I'm scrambling around and actually funny story is when we met, I didn't even know you were one of our panelists. <laughs> You're asking for like, where's an outlet? I just need to plug in my computer. I'm like, I'm scrambling all around I'm like who is this who's behind? and I'm like oh no that's one of our STEM panelists um so super excited that we are coming full circle as this year is wrapping up uh, you have been a dear friend of the Ash Academy ever since um so let's get started engineering manager what exactly do you do as that yeah a great question so I feel like most people are very confused as what an engineering manager does. And I think it was a little bit confusing for me as well. <laughs> but what I really focus on and what the main purpose of the role is to just make sure that the environment that we're creating for developers and product people and designers and QA people are is one that allows for work to be done. So I'm thinking about depending on what the project I'm working on, what the roadmap looks like, I'm making sure that my developers understand what we're building and why, um, making sure that the product understands what the devs or and engineers are saying like they can and can't do. Just to be like that middle, uh, middle person so that I can make sure things are getting done and that when there are issues going on, meaning that we can't complete something, I tell the higher ups like, hey, this is a problem we're running into, these are some of the solutions, or maybe we need help figuring out some of these solutions. And then on the flip side, when things are going really great, I'm the person that will highlight and really champion for my team to say like, this person is doing an amazing job at an XYZ thing. I think they should be in this meeting, make sure that I'm being a sponsor for the people on my team, my humans, and make sure that they're getting the limelight and making sure that everyone knows all the amazing work that they do. Um, and then, so like, that's how I keep the team together. But then the flip side of it is that I'm also talking about things like giving feedback and doing reviews and making sure that people understand how they're doing in the company so that there's no surprises and that everyone's being able to have the career development and support that they need and then when I start to notice that the team is struggling with different things, whether it be like they're overworked or people are starting to show signs of burnout, I need to make sure that I am 
building out the team by doing hiring and making sure that we have sound onboarding and things like that. So the team can just focus on functioning versus thinking about all of those other things on top of writing code or coming up with product roadmaps or things like that. Well, that sounds amazing, especially working in tech. That that sounds like a beautiful role, especially being as a liaison, touching so many lives uh, within a project. So awesome, awesome. Like, how does someone get to that point, though? Like, what what was your career journey? Oh, mine is very non-traditional. Uh, I'm actually a self-taught developer. I went to school for psychology and art and realized very quickly I couldn't afford grad school. So like I Googled online, like uh, top paying jobs that you can have working from home, web development was one of them. So I'm like, okay, that's it. I'm gonna teach myself um, and go down that route. So did a lot of online courses, um, was a big part of different communities to help me understand what it means to work in tech and landed my first job. I started to, um, a lot of my early jobs that I had were very, it required me to do a lot of work on my own. So I got to build my technical skill set very quickly in a lot of my early roles. And that led me to really focus by the time I got to mid-level, about like three, four years in, focus on communication and some of what people call the soft skills. Like how do you run a meeting? What does it mean to work with the scrum master? What does it mean? Like how can I help the team work better together and things like that. And so by doing that type of work um, and also around that time, I started jumping back into the tech community and doing a lot of teaching. Mm -hmm. I realized I love the idea of helping people realize their place in tech. So I started doing more and more research on how can I do that? And that's when um, I started taking on more of those roles. And I got a job at a startup where they made me like the lead developer for a team. And I got there excited to write a lot of code. They're like, you know what, actually you have the best skills to be a manager. So you're now a manager. Um, so that was my transition into it. Mm -hmm. There are a number of different ways that you can be, or anyone can become a manager. That was just one. I know that some people never wrote a line of code a day in their lives, but they have management skills and they can still become an engineering manager. So it just depends on one, the company, and then two, what you wanna do. For me, I liked being hands-on at code, so this made the most sense, but if this is something you wanna do, you can definitely carve out your own career path. Uh, that's just, so, you know, so many gems in what you just said. Uh, uh, yeah, I can't even uh, think of the, the what is the, like some of the ingredients of a manager, like so, some of those things that they saw in you that you're like, oh yeah, okay, like I, I see it, so. Um. So I think what it is, is that I loved teaching. Um, mm -hmm. I was able to teach a boot camp at UCLA and that's where I realized, you know what, I like explaining things and I also, was very mindful of and was very interested in planning out projects and saying like, okay, I know I have this uh, big project that I have to take on. It, I was always given very little details because people knew that I could just figure things out. And I constantly did that. And I, I think it was when I was at the startup that they gave me the management title Mm -hmm. The reason why they gave it to me is on like within my first like three weeks of working there, I was able to take on this massive project that connected all of the departments together. It basically ran the operations internally. And I was able to take just the idea and what the end goal was supposed to be. I was able to map out, like do a year long roadmap of what that would take. And I would say, okay, based off of the team now, this is what we can accomplish in X amount of months. And I said, that if we hire and uh, two more people here, we'll be able to reduce it, the timeline to look like this. And I just built out a roadmap that would allow us to build out 
the entire application with the the limited information that I had and present it to the founders who were not technical, but they were still able to understand everything that needed to happen. So I think that's, that's kind of a mix of what an engineering manager is, that that's like one piece of it. The mm -hmm. other piece of it is being able to create that environment that will keep, retain your talent, retain your humans, as well as helping your humans grow. So within my time at that company, I was also able to help reduce conflict. Um, I was able to kind of guide some of our UX people and designers to help them level up and make sure that they felt that they were supported and connected with the dev team so that they had a good working environment, as well as just let the team have fun. So being able to create like team outings, like we went to go get boba and like that was a whole thing. It was a team ritual that made it easier for us to come together when we had conflict and solve it. So I think it's not really one individual thing. It's just they saw a lot of these different qualities and helped me string it together, which I think makes really good management, like being able to pinpoint other people's skills and say like, you would be perfect for this title. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's awesome. So you did pivot into tech from psychology, but I feel like psychology is very much with you wherever you're going. Like that, that background isn't something you've just kind of left alone, right? Like, especially in a man managerial position, working with a lot of people. Yeah, so that's actually very funny. Um, it definitely hasn't left me at all. I think I use it more than I give myself credit for, mm -hmm. uh, just because I don't have like the title of therapist, but I do use it a lot. I, I have found that companies are, once they see I have a psychology background, they actually are more excited to talk to me because of my degree. And it's a lot of the reasons probably why I got pushed into management so um, early on. It's because they realized like that it takes a different type of skill set. It's a whole different career path versus being a IC or individual contributor as a developer versus going into management. So a lot of people when they're hiring, they were excited and they wanted someone who wanted to make that transition. Um, I think it was like my second dev job. They told me like, hey, if you stay here for like 10 years, you'll be a director and like you can move up the ladder. I didn't do that because in order for that to happen, a lot of people had to quit and no one ever quit from that job. But like being able to have that background really helped me. Yeah, that that is a major uh, <laughs> issue for a career tra trajectory where someone has to quit for me to move up. That doesn't really make me want to stick around somewhere. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, transitioning into tech by choice, how did that come to be? Like, where where was the um, the idea, the background there? Yeah, so I started tech by choice. It was something that I always knew I wanted to do, but I just didn't understand how to do it or, and I didn't have the confidence that I could pull it off that anyone would, would think that it's a good idea because I said it. And that took just time uh, with me growing into my skill set. But the reason why I started it was because I was a part of other communities that were looking to support uh, underrepresented folks in tech. But when I was a part of those communities on my learning journey, it starting off in tech, I didn't really feel that supported. They mm -hmm. said all of the right things and the marketing looked decent, but in a, the, the policies and the way that it played out, it actually excluded me out of a lot of the stuff, whether it be where the events were taking place or how much the classes took that I that I was interested in, or just the fact that there weren't a lot of people when I went to those courses that looked like me, even though they said like, hey, we're welcoming space, just the way that things played out, it didn't welcome everyone. And so 
I try to partake in those communities to try to give back and make a difference. I got a lot of pushback where I would say like, hey, did you know you're actually excluding a big part of the people that you're saying you're trying to help? There, there was acknowledgement of that, and, but no change. I'm like, oh, okay, so you understand you just don't want to take action and make things better. And by that time I had done a lot of work myself. Like I was able to teach a boot camp, which I thought was way out of my league, but I, I did have some success that made me feel confident. Um, I shared the story and what I wanted to do, of my vision with a friend. She's like, that's amazing. That's what I've been looking for because it's just not out there. People are struggling, trying to get into tech and learn about tech and no one is doing something that'll make it easy for them to learn. And so I'm like, okay, so I'm not the only one with this idea, like this could be something. And today we officially turned two years old. So we're a thing, like that's how we started. Awesome. Yeah. Well, happy birthday tech by choice. Right, I'm excited. Uh, awesome, awesome. Um, so what has been the most challenging part of starting <laughs> tech by choice? I think the most challenging part is understanding how to scale things back so that I can be as intentional as possible versus doing all the things and then failing at a lot of things. Um, because I had all these like really big, great ideas when I first thought of Tech by Choice and I wanted to really represent and try to support the community in a very authentic way. I thought that meant I had to do everything. Um, and then I realized like, no, that's not what people want. People need different things at different times. And because we work with all underrepresented communities, different communities need different things. Not, not all of us, we all have similar struggles. They're not the same. So I can't come up with one generic solution for everyone. So that that's always an internal struggle for me because I'm like I need to help as many people as possible but I also need to to do it from a good space so that I'm not I'm not one of those per people who say like well my intentions were versus like what the actual impact is absolutely yeah um, I'm smiling and laughing a lot because I I also am a founder or I gotta say co-founder because of my sisters but like a lot of the as struggles along the way are like, okay, I want to do this, 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 and this. And then it's like, I cannot do all of that. And we need more people to help us. And we need to just wait until we have more volunteers to kind of facilitate that. Um, but yeah, I, <laughs> just like, it can't be one person doing everything. And it's not your t intention to do everything. It's just, there's an idea and then you need more people. And then yeah, so <laughs> so that's uh, definitely uh, relate to that. Um, but for the most rewarding, since you guys have met that two year mark, what has been the most rewarding part of the organization? I think the most rewarding part is being able to do the work, like seeing, like uh, working with you with the hack and learn. That was amazing. Being able to see so many people push through and make sure that we are supporting minority owned businesses during a time that was very difficult for a number of different reasons during that program. That was, that was amazing. I'm still in contact with some of the business owners and they are telling me their success stories and all of these different things. I'm like, yeah, that's why we put in the, all that time for this program. And same thing with just working with the community day to day, being able to um, have folks reach out to me and say like, hey, I got some feedback from the Slack group or from this event and I just got a job offer for this job. And it's like, I'm now in the six figure, uh, I'm now making six figures and it's because I got that support from the community. And I think Sorry. it's not so much the money that people are making, it's the confidence that I'm seeing people have to know that they can do these things that even when things feel scary, they know that they can fall back on our Slack group or shoot us an email or anything if they have any questions. Uh, being able to be that support system is what makes it worth it. So awesome.
that kind of gets me uh, into the advice uh, portion of this. What's some of the worst advice you've been given across your career? Goodness, there's so many. <laughs> like, I feel like they're everyone. I think people try to, to shield others from like the mistakes that they've made. Um, and I think that's great. That's something very natural. But sometimes when you're doing that, people push their own biases into that feedback. Um, I was told that I should not ever go, I should never apply for a engineering manager role until like I secure one in a job that I'm currently working in, despite the, the job that I was at at that time being very toxic. And it mm. made me question if I should stay in tech. They're like, just keep pushing through until you can become an engineering manager because that's your only way you can get there. And for a while I believed it, but then it took me a second. And I'm like, no, look at all of these things I've accomplished. And people didn't think I could do that either. Let me just try. So I think the, to sum that up, being able, anyone who gives you any information that will limit the way that you can do something, saying that it's only one way to achieve something will always be bad advice. Mm. I mean, it's got to be a process, though, to get to that point where you're like, uh, maybe what they're saying is not really panning out. Like, where did you come to that, um, I guess, acknowledgement of I don't have to stay at one company uh, and best because it is an investment to stay there for a decade. Let's just put it very clearly <laughs> for everyone out there who's thinking about their career, like to stay at one company for this generation is not the norm mm -mm. for 10 years, not the norm. Uh, there may be people who do that, but like, where do you, where do you come to that uh, revelation that I don't, I don't need to invest ten years at one company, especially yeah. if it's toxic? That's that's another layer on top of it. But like, if even if it's not toxic, but yeah. So the way that I came to that conclusion, it was multiple ways. I had a com amazing community that I felt comfortable and safe with explaining some of my experiences in the workplace. And they helped me realize that what I was experiencing was not normal, that it should not be happening. And that was actually a toxic work environment. So that was like the number one thing that helped me get there. The other one was finding out that I was being extremely underpaid for, for market rate. Um, I think I, I finally got to a position where I was comfortable enough to share with people that I was only making like $52,000 as a developer and a lead UX person. So like I would had lead in my title and I was mm -hmm. making way below market rate. So like that was strike number two. And then the other part of it was I had to just build my own confidence. So this didn't happen overnight. I didn't have like one conversation with someone. I didn't like look up salaries and then the next day I'm like, I'm out of here. It actually took me half a year to make that jump because I had to take the time to like work through all of that. I had to figure out like, well, did I do something wrong for me to be so underpaid? Was it something I said do that during the interview process? Uh, then they kept telling me like I was being paid so well. I'm like, well, maybe everyone else is lying. Maybe that's what's going on. Or maybe I do need to stay here. And this is the only company that will allow me to ever be in management. And I, I walked through those things um, through like Slack conversations, Zoom calls with people in the industry and just slowly start to figure out like, no, these are, there are other options out there. And when I finally got to that point where I'm like, no, I, I'm good at my job. I understand what I'm doing. I know my skill set. I started applying and I got offers. I'm just like, oh yeah, no, this is it. Like as soon as I got that first offer after that toxic job, I'm like, I'm out of here. I'm never looking back. And it was actually the best decision that I made. Awesome. Awesome. So what's some of the best advice that you've gotten along the way? Because I'm feeling like your community really lifted you up. Um, so what, what did they say? You know, I've gotten so many amazing tidbits. Um, one of the, the best things that I've done personally is to find a mentor that is doing what I want to do. 
So that, that was great. Um, and they helped me like navigate this space because I only know what I'm privy to. So uh, when I entered in tech, I thought, oh, I did it. I achieved all of my dreams. I got a junior developer job. And then someone told me like, mm, you're just starting. I'm just like, oh, okay. So there's more options. So being able to have a mentor uh, is great. But I think the other bit of advice that I got recently that really flipped a switch for me is to create a tech exit plan. Now that's probably just a marketing way to say like, figure out retirement. Like how do you wanna to get to retire? But the way that it was framed to me was like, okay, I'm doing all of these other things outside of work. I have this nonprofit, like I'm supporting the community, I'm creating content, but why? Like, why am I doing that? And use my why to help me navigate and make my different career jumps so that I can get to the next level to help feed my why. And each time I make that jump, make connections, network. So I'm constantly feeding my why so I can give back to my bigger purpose and I'm getting one step closer to retiring. So I thought like, wow, that's such a um, intentional way to move through your career, especially in tech where you have so many options. Like once you get in, it's hard to figure out like what, what your next step could be. Interesting. That's that's so powerful. Would you mind sharing some of your whys? Not all of them, but like anything that is public public domain at this point. <laughs> so one of my big whys is to help people know that um, to get in any industry that you want to get into, whether it's tech or not, um, if you're an underrepresented person, you have to address the other barriers. So for me, the big barrier that I like to talk about is mental health. Um, there are a number of things that uh, I'll speak for the Black community that we go through that it's hard to talk about, that it's hard to be able to be your whole self. And because of that, uh, therapy will help you be your whole self and help you understand your connections to certain things. Like for me, I try to be I, I, I'm working to not be so materialistic. <laughs> it's very hard, but working through things like that will make it easier for me to understand my relationship with money, um, to help me be more financially literate. And to do those things, I have to address my mental health, my financial literacy, all of these things so I could be better in my day-to-day -day life so that I can move in tech and be better in tech and use that salary to do something to, to feed my why. Um, so that's one of my whys is to spread that mes message that learning skills is great, but you have to take care of your whole self to be able to li live your purpose. I mean, uh, this is the first time I'm calling someone on a one-on-one -on -one pastor, but Valerie is the pastor today. Like <laughs> <laughs> you're preaching, I can't. Yes, every every bit of that. Um, very much so. Um, here at the Ash Academy, uh, we have our three programs: um, parental engagement, mentorship, scholarships. But our social outreach is definitely in line with mental health. We just did a check-in for people because people have been on lockdown or quarantine or in various phases of this, but it has definitely impacted everyone. Whether you're an introvert and you prefer to be remote and not have to go into the office anymore, you're still affected by the fact that you can't meet up with friends or as many friends as before. So it's, and I, I have definitely uh, pulled back some layers on myself, like, yeah, you might prefer to work from home, but like, there are some interactions that have to be in person and that affects mm -hmm. you. Um, and just existing in corporate, uh, spaces uh being black th there's just so much there um we won't that's a whole other <laughs> episode right, right. but but still like there there are certain ways you exist in this world um and unless you address it you you might be uh i guess shooting yourself in the foot in in your uh, career trajectory um so yes you are definitely <laughs> being a pastor <laughs> to me hopefully there's some other people out there
Um, I think this is a perfect transition into our Q and A portion of the interview. Um, so, who is your biggest inspiration? Maya Angelou. Um, oh. Right? Not typical, right? Um, I remember being really young and reading her books, and I didn't like pineapples. I hated pineapples. But I read one of her books, and she described in such great detail how much she loved pineapples to the point like she was describing how she opened it and how it tastes and how it sounded. And then I'm like, you know what? I think I like pineapples. And ever since then, I've liked pineapples. I'm like, how can you be so powerful with words written years ago to affect someone like as I was sitting there in the library reading it, that book, that, that part of that, that page and say like, I now like pineapples and it changed. So I'm like the, she taught me the power of words and how if you can describe a story, you can change a life. Awesome. Yes, a uh, big fan over here. Love, <laughs> love, love, love her. Um, who do you hope to uplift? You kind of already mentioned this, but who do you hope to uplift uh, with your work? Um, honestly, myself sounds very selfish, but I always tell people I'm an advocate for other people so that I can better speak up for myself. Absolutely. You, you got to you gotta put that ac oxygen mask on yourself first before you can help other people. So appreciate that. Um, and then how do you stay engaged with your, um, with your motivation? Oh, so I try to just stay connected with the community. Like okay, I'm starting to be more and more high level with the work that we're doing, but I'm on Twitter. Uh, I make it, I shouldn't say this. But I'm actually running the Twitter account. So when there's typos, that's me. Um, but I do that just because I want to see what people are saying, what's going on, how people are feeling. Um, I try to stay active in our Slack so I understand what's going on. Um, and just like being out there, it, it's really helped me. Awesome. Yes, social media is a gift and a curse, uh, but we appreciate it for the access to people. Um, shout out to Slack. Um, I'm actually learning that Slack for tech people might be something that I need to just start just joining in on. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of different spaces that I'm a part of that Slack is a big thing for them. Um, mm -hmm. So I might just have to stop being so stubborn and <laughs> just <laughs> jump on those, accept those uh, invites. Um, so what's next for you? What's next for a tech by choice? We, we will do those separately because you you exist in two different spaces. We, we won't just <laughs> do all tech by choice, but yeah, what's next for both of those things? Um, so next for me is I definitely want to keep pushing the engineering and management track and go explore with that. I'm actually uh, I'm, I'm a little nervous to say this, but I want to start creating content. Like I want to start a YouTube channel, I, but I have the problem of staying consistent with all the stuff that I'm doing. Um, but I think I'm going to do it. I've been working on writing a book to help non-traditional awesome. techies learn how to tackle algorithm, algorithms. And I found that I'm in a position now where I can start creating content. So I'm just like, let me go ahead and flip that switch and start doing that. Um, so that's for what I'm working on from a personal standpoint for tech by choice. I, there's so much that we want to do. Um, but I think our next big step is to just really focus on our open source, uh, community and our initiatives so that we can turn that into a paid program. Cause we're very tired of hearing how people want to mentor underrepresented folks and that we're, we know historically that we're overworked and underpaid. So if we're gonna be doing work in our free time. Tech by Choice is looking to make it a standard to pay people their, their worth as, as close as you can possibly get. So we're trying to live up to our own standards and pay folks for the open source work that they do. Awesome, awesome. Well, you know what, Valerie, aka Pastor, we are so <laughs> thankful <laughs> for you uh, being here today, sharing so many gems. Uh, anything you want to collaborate with here at the Ash Academy or me specifically, let me know. Would love to uh, help you out with that. Um, 
But yeah, everyone, thank you for joining us for another episode of the Ash Academy's Inspire, Uplift, Engage podcast. I'm Sammy Ash. Everyone, take care. Thank you.